All right, everybody, it is 7.30. We're gonna give people a few more minutes to wander on in. While we're waiting uh, for those that are here in the chat, we're just curious uh, who here is dive certified? What level certification are you certified at and where did you learn to scuba dive? Uh, of course, and if you don't know how to scuba dive, uh, you're uh, gonna be learning this summer or learning at some point this year. Uh, this, this, uh, this webinar is still great for you. Uh, some good takeaways and we're gonna try and keep it really, uh, really simple as we delve into the, uh, the scuba diving science. So, but yeah, feel free to share. All right, we've got open water, Southern California. Some cold water diving, like it. All right, we've got a snorkeler. It's great, ready to take the leap, the plunge, if you will. Jacksonville, Florida, okay, very cool. Snooba. Snooba's a lot of fun. Surface supplied air. That's pretty neat. Costa Rica is a good spot to do it. And we've got Raleigh, North Carolina. Bringing it home. I learned to scuba dive in New Jersey. Uh, in case anybody, yeah, I know. I know, maybe I should have just kept that to myself. <laughs> but uh, you know, I learned in, in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef. So, all right, okay. you got me beat, Claire. <laughs> got me beat. That was a lot more pleasant, I think. And uh, we've got open water in Hawaii, Teresa. Oh, what island? Nice. What island in Hawaii? Monterey. We got another California. Minnesota. <sighs> Minnesota. Dance of modern Fiji. That's a diverse crowd. I like that's it. The, that's the way to do it. Start off in Minnesota, advanced in Fiji. Definitely mm -hmm. uh, a good call. Yeah, it definitely helps you appreciate <laughs> warm water. Oahu, nice. All right. Couple more minutes. Uh, about three more minutes should be enough time if you want to throw in some popcorn. Get ready <laughs> for diving the material world, the science of scuba diving with Claire and Patrick. Have you ever tried snooper, Patrick? I have not. No, me either. You're missing out, probably. I'm probably. Yeah. It's a little cold. Now we open water, Central PA. Is that Dutch Springs, Central PA? Is that, I see Thomas. And we have a question, what is snuba? So snuba essentially is a, a dive tank that is attached to a flotation device that sits on the surface. And that tank has hoses hanging off of it. Um, so divers, Essentially, it's a slightly underwater snorkeling and scuba diving combined. So, so uh, the divers will have weights on, so they'll be negatively buoyant, um, and there will be a, a dive guide or dive leader who's on scuba, kind of moving the board and moving the group around. Uh, so it's kind of surface supplied air. It's pretty neat. Um, so it's not quite snorkeling, not quite scuba diving, somewhere in between. Got 10 more seconds. You want to do a countdown, Claire? <laughs> no. All right. I think we can get this party started. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
Without further ado, welcome to Diving in the Material World, the science of scuba diving. Uh, I'm Patrick and this is Claire. We're both uh, broad reach dive instructors here at headquarters in Raleigh, North Carolina, both Patty IDC staff instructors. Uh, we are not scientists, we are not marine biologists, um, but we play them on, on TV. So we're gonna try and explain some concepts here uh, and get y'all excited about some of the scientific properties that help us scuba dive. And so I'm gonna start by introducing ourselves. And if I can go back to slide two, we can properly introduce ourselves. Yeah. So I'm on the left. My name's Patrick, that's me there in, uh, that's in the Bahamas, diving with some Caribbean reef sharks. I uh, started my journey with Broadreach in 2012 in the Bahamas. Uh, as I revealed earlier, learned how to dive in New Jersey. I've been teaching scuba diving since 2010. I currently oversee our world diving and marine biology programs here at Broadreach. And I've had the good fortune of leading trips in Bali, the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, uh, the Caribbean, Cayman Brock with Claire, actually, uh, Fiji, Curacao, and my favorite fish is the mandarin fish. Um, yeah, I'm Claire. Hi, everyone. Um, I also started in 2010 with Broadreach in the um, in the Caribbean and have been there kind of ever since uh, helping out our fleets down there. So I've, I've led almost every single Caribbean trip, but mostly I've done a lot of work with the dive masters and the instructors. So um, a lot of our a lot of our um, fledgling dive instructors have had me as their instructor. Um, yep, I've also led trips with with Patrick and a couple of trips to like Curacao and Cayman and, and places like that with um, with Broadreach as well. All right. Um, so what we have in store for you tonight, the water, as our scuba divers know, and as our non scuba divers might find out, does weird and wonderful things to our senses and bodies. And to make sense of how the water affects us and how we can survive beneath the waves, we turn to science. Uh, so this evening, we're going to look at a few questions. We'll explore the mechanics of how we can breathe underwater. We're going to see how physics lets us even get underwater in the first place. We'll investigate why things look so different underwater. Uh, we'll see why talking and cell phones don't work well underwater. Uh, we'll see how we keep up with all those cool creatures of the ocean. And we'll finally see how long we can stay underwater with our new friends. And we'll wrap it all up, see how we can apply everything that we've learned. So let's start with our first question. How do we breathe underwater? For 10,000 points, who is this guy? Feel free to answer in the chat. First one. 10,000 points. Who is this? No, it's not my uncle. Jacques Cousteau, Xander. Good job. Uh, so Jacques Cousteau, once upon a time, said the sea, once it casts its spell, holds one in its net of wonder forever. Uh, and so he is also the father of recreational scuba diving, invented what we call the aqualung, uh, there's a look at it, those double hoses, pretty rudimentary looking. Uh, it's a little bit different from what we have now. Uh, this is our modern scuba setup. And I actually have a tank here with me today and a regulator. I'll do a little demonstration here if I can in some confined space. But the important part of how we breathe underwater is first really understanding the scuba tank. So this is a uh, aluminum scuba tank. This is 63 cubic feet. Uh, most scuba divers are going to be using an 80 cubic foot tank and uh, they go up as large as about 100 cubic feet. And so inside this tank is a lot of high pressure air. So if I were to let all the air out of this tank, it's going to make quite a little bit of a noise, all that high pressure. If I were to let all this out, it would fill a telephone booth. Uh, I don't know if anybody here in our chat has been in a telephone booth. I had to Google it. Uh, it's pretty big. Uh, if you took one of those larger tanks, about 100 cubic feet of air, that would fill a walk-in closet. Um, I'm a dive instructor. I don't have a walk-in closet, but I hear they're pretty big. So we've got air in here. A lot of people will sometimes mistakenly say oxygen. Uh, it is normal breathing air. Uh, there in our chat, does anybody know what kind of gases make up air? Quite a popular type of first stage regulator. Uh, so what happens here is that the first stage reduces all of that high pressure air from 3000 PSI to uh, an intermediate pressure stage. And so if you're looking at this cutaway, 
you'll see two chambers. So we've got our high pressure air coming from the scuba cylinder, 3000 PSI, filling this chamber here. So this is a high pressure chamber. And then you've got a piston, you've got a bias spring, and you've actually got holes in the side of the regulator. So the human body actually has a lot of trouble breathing air at different pressures. So we need to always have water coming into the regulator to actually uh, get us to that uh, sort of sweet spot of being able to breathe air at the surrounding water pressure. But essentially what happens is, and you'll see this port to the second stage, we had our first stage here, which leads to our second stage, which is the breathy thingy. So if we look at what happens when we open, as we breathe, we demand air. So eventually this intermediate pressure chamber, which is about 140 PSI, we breathe air, that pressure drops, high pressure air goes in and starts to fill this chamber. It goes right to that second stage. Uh, so that's what it looks like when it's open. Once all that pressure, that intermediate pressure heads to the second stage, this is a cutaway of our second stage regulator. This is the piece you put in your mouth. These are known as demand valves, meaning they supply air on demand. This would be the opposite of a continuous flow. The regulator is open. It's essentially a big plastic cup uh, exposed to the ambient pressure of the water. So when you inhale, the pressure in the second stage drops below ambient pressure. Uh, the water pressure pushes on this, which is the diaphragm. So let's take a look at what happens when that actually opens up. So that diaphragm moves, hits that lever, opens this valve, that air from the first stage comes in and eventually to the diver. So, ta-da, we can breathe. <laughs> All this is due to those varying gradients of pressure change throughout the system, going from the tank to the first stage and eventually to the second stage. Uh, when we exhale, pressure <coughs> increases back in the system and eventually that closes the valve. So these machines involving pressure pistons, valves, levers are how we breathe underwater. So let's figure out how we got underwater in the first place. <laughs> Take it away, Claire. <laughs> Yeah, that's a lot of uh, complicated machinery, but it, it keeps us safe. But um, let's start with an easier question. Um, have a think about um, if you can think if hippos swim or not. Can hippos swim? And you can put the answer in the chat. It's kind of a yes or no question. It's not too taxing. Well, we'll have a see. Yes, no, under, yeah. Uh, well, we'll get to that question. <laughs> Let's think about how we get underwater. Um, and that should be pretty easy, right? We should just be able to sink. Um, and if you're not a scuba diver, you might think that, that people sink quite easily. Um, but we don't actually sink that easily, even with that heavy scuba gear on the tank and all the, all the gear that we have weighs quite a lot. But um, Humans are actually positively buoyant in water. And even with our scuba tank and all the gear, we're still positively buoyant. We tend to float. Um, and that's because we have uh, quite a lot of body fat. Um, women have a bit more body fat than men. And so they tend to uh, tend to float a little bit better than men. There are some very uh, muscly people who will sink without any weight, but for most of us, we, we're going to need some weights to help us uh, get down, down uh, under the water. And we, when we scuba dive, we have those on our belt or in the weight pockets that we're using as well. Um, and so we're going to let all the air out of our BCD to make sure that's not um, helping us flow. And we're going to start sinking. Um, and as we descend, we'll find that that gets easier and easier as, um, as we make that descent. But it can be a little bit tricky because we're, we, our tendency is to, to float. Um, and so if, we, if you're having trouble um, uh, starting your dive and sinking, like I know I get that sometimes if I haven't quite got enough weight on. Um, it's important to kind of relax, let all the air out of your lungs as well as your VCD. Um, stop moving around because sometimes people move around a little bit too much and that can um, actually help us get to the top. So we want to relax and just um, feel heavy. I always find that feeling uh, making myself feel heavy helps me. It's weird, but um, it's all psychology. But as we sink, we'll get more and more um, uh, 
the weight will have more and more of an effect and will go sl uh, faster and faster um, once we get past those first few feet. Um, and then we're becoming negatively buoyant. And I'll, I'll uh, not spend too long on that because I know Patrick's going to talk a bit more about buoyancy. Um, but we're positively buoyant on the surface weights help us get negatively buoyant um, and then of course underwater we want to be neutrally buoyant which is when we're not floating or sinking um, and that's something we spend a lot of time practicing when we're doing um, our diving when we're doing courses like the peak performance buoyancy we'll spend a lot of time on uh, on perfecting our buoyancy and kind of the, the ultimate thing that we want the nirvana of diving really is to be able to get to the point where we can use not only our bcd the, the pockets of air in our bcd but we can also use the air in our lungs to to go up and down and so we will breathe in a little bit and go up and exhale and go down a little bit and so the reason we were kind of talking about hippos and why Patrick found that really cute picture of the hippo was that hippos are very similar to us when they're underwater. So how the hippo does it is they also are very positively <laughs> buoyant, but they have bone density um, that helps them sink. But they can use their uh, breath, their lungs, um, and also their, their kind of position in the water um, to help them sink and float. And so whoever said they know they walk, I think that was Caroline, it's true, they don't swim so much as they kind of gallop under the water. Um, and of course, everyone um, would love to see, I'm sure, a picture of baby hippos running around. Um, so uh, uh, I found you one, you're welcome. Of course, who wouldn't? <laughs> who wouldn't? <laughs> Will it work? Will it? Of course it will. Baby hippo. Look at him go. He's kind of running and gliding oh. along. <laughs> Very graceful. Woo. Yeah. He's still kind of learning to control this point. So yeah. All right, that's got to be the highlight, I think. <laughs> Any excuse to show a cute baby hippo video. Absolutely. All right, so we can breathe and we were able to get underwater. Now, how do we see underwater? I'm probably not alone here. Has anyone ever opened your eyes underwater and things look a little bit blurry? Yes, good guy. Okay. I was gonna say, if you could see clearly, then we'll just talk after, the, after this uh, presentation, kind of find out scientifically what's happening. But yeah, so why everything looks blurry underwater? This is due to refraction. Uh, refraction is the bending of light rays. Uh, and essentially, why we're not able to see clearly underwater is due to changes in density of the medium, so air or water, through which light passes. Um, so the amount of light refracted when it passes through the cornea is due to the difference in density between air and the cornea. Air is air, cornea is mostly water. Uh, if we have a large difference in density, that's good because that means there's going to be a large angle of refraction. A lot of refraction is happening. Uh, then eventually the image hits the back of our eye upside down. Our brains are really good at then converting that into a right side up image. Uh, that's what's happening on land over here. Underwater, we have a very similar density between water and our cornea, since both are essentially, well, water is water, the corneas are mostly water. Uh, and so the angle of refraction is gonna be much shallower. Uh, and so when light passes from water to the cornea, very little refraction occurs. Uh, the lens and the cornea work really, really hard to make up for all the refraction that is lost. But ultimately, this is why when we open our eyes underwater, everything appears blurry. So how do we fix this? How do we adjust for what science has got us up to? The solution is to wear a dive mask. Oh, let's see. I should probably even practice this before. Let's see. All right. Here's our dive mask. Oh, yeah. It does help. Cool. All right. So we've got our dive mask. 
And what we need to do is we need to restore that crucial air space between the eye and the water. So we've got this lens. This allows light waves to travel through the air before they pass through the cornea, allowing light to refract at the proper angle to focus the image on the retina. But it's not perfect. So for our snorkelers, for our scuba divers, have you ever reached for something underwater and had your grab fall short? That's refraction again, thanks to our friend over here who just popped in, Mr. Snell. Uh, this is Snell's Law. So the interface between water and your mask obeys Mr. Snell's Law, uh, which describes, and I quote, uh, the relationship between the angle of incidence and refraction when referring to light or other waves passing through a boundary between two different isotropic media, such as water, glass, or air. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but essentially, when air is refracting, it's refracting at an index of one versus the refraction index of water, which is 1.33. So we're talking about the angle of refraction. This basically means that objects underwater will look about 33% larger. So that refractive index of 1.33, 33% larger, that's where that number comes from. This means that normally objects that appear underwater are also gonna look a little bit closer. This is great if you're marginally nearsighted like I am. So I do wear contact lenses uh, on land, but underwater, I don't need to because everything will be magnified that much more. Uh, so for those of you that are nearsighted, you might not have to get prescription lenses, uh, which is pretty cool. Also, fun thing out there is called visual reversal. So things can actually seem further away. You're saying, hey, Patrick, you just told me things are going to look closer and larger. But due to particulate in the water, turbidity, uh, water clarity, if that has been diminished, things can actually look further away. So essentially water is messing with our brains and how we interpret all that information. Uh, so yeah, water can do some funny things to our vision, uh, even when we don't expect it. Here's the last thing that water is gonna do uh, to our vision. Oh, here's our friend refraction again. Just so you remember the key phrase. There we go. All right. Let's talk about color absorption. If you think back to your first dive or snorkel or snuba experience on a deep reef, uh, you might recall noticing that those bright red sea fans and coral, uh, those diverse colors you're used to seeing in, in photos might not quite be there in real life. This is because as you descend deeper, uh, water filters out color. So let's check out this video. this one. I'll kind of talk over it a little bit. So color loss occurs gradually because water absorbs different wavelengths of light at different degrees. Now there's our refraction cue again. Uh, so as we're going down, the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy, uh, which means these wavelengths get absorbed first. So that longest wavelength, the lowest energy, is going to be red. So the order in which they get absorbed first goes in which order they appear in the rainbow. So you'll see red going first, eventually orange, yellow, green, blue. Violet is gonna be second to last. That's a little bit of a spoiler alert there, but ultraviolet <laughs> is gonna be last to disappear. So you may have noticed that the neon pink cap, that one over there, uh, which has ultraviolet light in it is vibrant throughout the whole video. And you'll notice as we get deeper and deeper that that red over here has completely changed colors. So a lot of underwater photographers, videographers will use red filters to bring that back into those photos that we're used to seeing uh, and kind of bring that light back, which is pretty neat. You'll notice that our diver here is just about to hit recreational dive limits and go a little bit past it. Does anybody here know, as an open water diver, what depth you're certified to dive to? Because we will not be going to 150, three, four, five feet. 60 feet. Yeah. Caroline, good job. Cool. So that's color absorption. Now that we know how we see underwater, how science lets us uh, process that information, let's find out how we hear underwater. 
just seeing Mara's comment about getting diving accessories, getting them in pink so that they always look good underwater. It's, it's a, another rule of scuba diving we should all adhere to. Nice, good advice there, Mara. Um, yeah, so how do we hear underwater? Um, why do the sounds that we hear um, often come from above us? So if you've ever been underwater and there's been a boat or something um, making a bit of noise, um, you'll very often think that it's directly above you, look up and see that that uh, it's not actually there and it can be quite far away in fact um, and it takes a bit of getting used to but um, there's a reason that sounds always seem to come from uh, overhead when we're underwater and that's to do with how uh, fast the sound travels when we're underwater this is another thing that's different um, about uh, the way our brain functions so um, all good dive masters know that sound travels four times faster in water as compared to air um, it's actually slightly faster in salt water than fresh water it's something I, I learned it's almost five times faster in salt water um, and so our ears have been trained um, from, it starts when, from the time we're born to locate sound in air, not underwater. And how we do this, you can see on this diagram, is that the time um, that a sound from the, from the place it, it, um, it ori originates, um, it hits our ears at slightly different uh, times. This is called sound localization. And the difference in time um, that you can see it uh, illustrated there by the red lines and that difference is the um, the difference in time tells us where the sound is coming from and that's something we learn like I say um, over time because those red lines are essentially faster underwater the sounds coming faster it hits our, our ears at differently to how it would be uh, in the air. And so we can't tell where, uh, where the sound's coming from. And so we interpret it as being from overhead. So if you practice a lot, I've not managed to do this. I don't know if Patrick has, but um, you can get a bit more used to hearing sounds underwater with a bit of practice. So instructors and people who, who, uh, who spend a lot of time down there um, can, but most people um, will find that it's a bit confusing. Um, to, to hear sounds underwater. Sound localization is kind of what, um, what, it me what the water messes with. Um, and there's uh, also um, the question, why does sound sound funny underwater? Why can't we talk underwater and be understood? Why does everything kind of sound muffled like we're talking underwater? Um, and the reason for this is, again, we're used to um, talking and listening in air and not water. Um, and so the way we hear in air is that the sound comes into our ears and it vibrates, the sound waves, sorry, vibrate the tiny little bones in your ear that are called the ossicles. Um, I think there's three of them. Um, it vibrates those tiny little bones and that's how our brain interprets the, the sound. Um, when we're underwater, uh, that can't happen. We're not in air anymore. And so uh, it doesn't uh, go as well to the ossicles. And something I learned recently was actually because we are, our bodies are mostly water, we're 70% water approximately, the sound, can, the sound waves can penetrate the flesh on our skulls and our, our, our skulls essentially become those bones that interpret sound. And so when the sound waves hit this mastoid bone behind our ear, that is what our brains can use um, to interpret the, the, the sound waves. And so our, our brain like interprets it differently um, and confuses us basically. <laughs> it also means that we can hear different things underwater so we can hear higher pitch sounds more easily and we kind of lose those lower pitch deeper sounds. So kind of the sounds of people squealing and screaming you can hear a bit better underwater um, and you can also <laughs> also um, here uh, lose the kind of deeper sounds as well. The other reason we can't talk while we're underwater is because crossing the air water barrier is hard for sound waves and so that's why when we're on the surface or on a boat and we try and scream at someone who's even a foot below the water it just doesn't work because crossing that ba barrier is hard and it's just ineffective and also the reason we can't talk underwater our vocal cords just can't produce the energy required to transmit the sound um, from the air in our in our uh, in our vocal cords to the water um, and also overcome all the other 
bubble sounds and sounds from our regulator as well. And so that's why we can't talk to each other underwater. You can try, you can shout real loud and sometimes hear a couple of words, but we certainly can't talk uh, like we would normally uh, underwater. Patrick, what are you going to tell All us right, about Yeah, next? the lights went out. That doesn't mean that we're, that's the intermission. We're, we'll just move through it. We've got a few, a few more to go. Uh, I've actually heard that uh, you can uh, just sort of take your hands and if you were to cup them around uh, the top of somebody's head and speak directly onto the top of their head that you can actually hear a little bit better. Uh, I think it might have to Makes do with sense. that mast mastoid bone that you're talking about. So yeah, that would yeah. be because the the sound will transmit through your fleshy, yeah. watery flesh. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Maybe we should try that next time we go. Yeah, we have to. All right, so that's how we hear underwater. Now we're going to discuss how we move underwater. Uh, the answer really is in two parts. Claire alluded to some of this when talking about how we even get underwater in the first place, but it's going to be neutral buoyancy plus propulsion. So let's talk about buoyancy. Uh, submerged objects exert downward force on water. Uh, which is gravity, and this all has to do with Archimedes, the, the father of buoyancy. There's Archimedes. How's it going? He doesn't look too happy, uh, but nonetheless, submerged objects exert a downward force on gravity, on water, rather, gravity, uh, and an object placed in water, water is going to exert an upward force, which is buoyancy on that submerged object. Archimedes, how does, how's he involved? Uh, once upon a time, he got in his bathtub and he realized that the water level rose and spilled over the sides. Actually, that's probably why he doesn't look too pleased uh, in this photo. Uh, the principle essentially states that an object wholly or partially immersed in a fluid is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. So displacement is the key takeaway here. Uh, a little visual illustration. So we have got a five kilogram weight being dunked into the water. Uh, we'll see that that weight has displaced two kilograms of water, meaning there's an upward buoyant force of two, two, two kilograms. You'll also notice that the scale is two kilograms lighter. So this is gonna be really key uh, to understanding uh, how we get neutrally buoyant, which is where we really want to be. Uh, another key is also water density and salinity. Uh, we've talked about how much salt water can affect not only how we hear in water, but it's also going to affect our buoyancy, how we move in water. Uh, if you check out the newsletter that we sent out, there's more info, some experiments on that, so highly recommend looking into that. But how does this all apply to scuba diving? We can think of buoyancy in three stages. We have got positive buoyancy, so that would mean that we are on the surface, we're snorkeling, we're kind of just stuck there. Uh, if we are negatively buoyant, that means we're going to be in the sand, uh, which isn't too great. What we really want to be is neutrally buoyant, uh, which is that perfect balance. So you'll see that we're essentially going to do it by increasing our displacement. So uh, we have got BCDs, buoyancy compensator devices for that. This is big jackets. I won't put it on because I'll probably knock some things over. But uh, essentially on the back here is a big bladder. It's like a big balloon. Uh, you'll fill it with air. Uh, so you've got this big balloon of air. We've also got our lungs. So you imagine if you're in the bathtub and you've displaced water. Uh, imagine if Archimedes had a balloon and he brought a balloon or multiple balloons into uh, that bathtub. That would displace more water, uh, adding to a certain amount of buoyancy. And so when we uh, increase our buoyancy, either by taking a deep breath in, of course, never holding our breath, or if we add air to our BCD, that helps us move away more water, displace more water, and become neutrally buoyant. Uh, that's going to allow us to move around a little bit more. Here's our neutral buoyancy turtle, always disapproving of our flailing. Once we are nice and neutrally buoyant, the key is going to be how do we keep up with the fish? This is going to be propulsion. So we've got scuba fins. Hi. Have you got some? So I've got fins. I brought all my gear. Yeah, never leave home without it. So we have got scuba fins, nice and flexible. But the basic function of a scuba fin is to generate forward propulsion or thrust by exploiting the resistance of water against anything moving through it. 
there's a little diagram that explains it pretty well. So animals have fins of their own, flippers, webbed feet, boats have oars, propellers, swimmers use their arms as well. Scuba divers aren't really gonna use their arms. Divers are really gonna focus on using fins. Snorkelers would also use these. So how does it work? Water pushes back against anything moving through it, uh, which is resistance. That means anything moving through the water has the potential to generate propulsion. Uh, so your legs generate propulsion when you do a flutter kick, for example, flutter kick would be up and down with your fins. So moving in this motion uh, up and down pushes water off and around your feet, creating that thrust. Uh, thrust, as I'm sure you all know, is the result of Newton's third law. What's up, Newton? This is often simplified to the catchy phrase, you may have heard this, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So as your legs push water behind you, there's a corresponding force that pushes you forward. Compared to say a frog's feet that are comparatively uh, our narrow human feet, uh, our feet in general are not good at creating that resistance and therefore creating that thrust. So how do we generate that, that thrust that we need? We increase the surface area of our feet by adding fins. So just like those webbed feet of a frog uh, or the flippers of a sea lion, that wider, flatter area of the fin is gonna create uh, and move more water, increasing our thrust. So displace more water, increase our thrust. Enter the scuba fin. So there's lots of ways to move. These are some of my personal favorites. We've got the flutter kick, that's a basic one, up and down. But we've also got, once we're neutrally buoyant, a lot of things at our disposal. We have got the frog kick. Smooth, easy. We have got the helicopter turn. Whoa, very cool, right? Could spin on a dime. And this one, a lot of people don't know, but you can actually move backwards. This one's better explained in person. Practice in a pool, but it's pretty neat. <laughs> so those fins not only are gonna provide that forward propulsion, but they also help us move in all sorts of interesting angles. Um, let's see, any other kicks you can think of? I can think of the dolphin kick. Uh, there's, there's no karate kick that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, there's lots of different ways to play with your fins and a lot of different ways to generate that propulsion. Uh, so we can move underwater. Now, how long can we stay underwater, Claire? How long indeed. Um, yeah, if everyone wants to have a go, writing in the chat, uh, what are the kind of things that affect the time we spend underwater? So how do we know when it's time to end our dive? Hopefully some of the certified scuba divers know this kind of stuff. Oh, if we're at 1500 PSI, maybe. Usually lower, yeah. <laughs> 1500 PSI, you probably turn the dive. That's usually when we turn around from where we've, uh, if we're doing an out and back kind of arrangement or not a drift dive, we might turn around. Um, but there's a few things that might affect how um, and when we'll end the dive. So one of the first ones, um, it's maybe not that obvious, is if we've seen everything that we want to see, if there's nothing more that we see, or if we've accomplished what we set out to achieve on our dive, which might be seeing a certain thing, um, or we've got lost, um, like in this picture. I've definitely done that before and uh, gone the wrong, on the wrong side of the reef. Um, another reason is, of course, that we might get cold underwater. Um, our bodies, um, it, are, do not do that well in water. Um, water conducts heat away from our bodies 20 times faster compared to air and that's why we get so cold when we're underwater. Um, so even in the Caribbean, even in Fiji, you're going to need a wetsuit um, and you will get cold eventually even in warm water. Um, another thing of course that might affect how, how long we stay under is of course our uh, the air in our scuba tank. So if we're running out of air, if we're running low on air, um, we'll want to end the dive. So we always want to keep an eye on that. But the last thing that will affect the length of our dive and also something we want to keep an eye on is our no decompression limit. 
Um, and this is uh, illustrated here by the recreational dive planner. So your open water divers will be, will be uh, familiar with this. You may have learned in a computer, with a computer, dive computer, um, it's the same thing, the dive computer and this little table here do the same thing essentially in different ways, but they use the same data. Um, and this is um, important to take uh, stock of to, to make sure we're monitoring because when we're under the water, we're under pressure. So the deeper we go, the more pressure we subject our bodies to. We're building up nitrogen in our systems. Um, as we breathe in air, the nitrogen that we take in is not metabolized by us. We don't use it for anything in our bodies. And so it tends to build up in our tissues um, when we're under pressure. So the deeper and the, we go and the longer we stay down, the more nitrogen, nitrogen uh, builds up in our, in our tissues. Um, and this doesn't cause us that many problems when we're down at depth, but as we come back up, that's when um, it can start to call, uh, cause us problems. So to make a safe dive, we need to stay in within the, the limits of the table um, or within the limits of our computer, what our computer is telling us to make sure we're not overloading our systems with nitrogen. Um, and basically, the, long, the deeper your dive is, the less time you'll have to stay at depth. Um, I, we could talk all night about uh, DCS and, and nitrogen limits and things like that, but it's important to know that those aren't foolproof, um, but they are have been tested um, over many years to provide us with a margin of safety uh, uh, when we're diving. Um, another reason, um, well, <laughs> another reason, um, as we are ascending, it's important to um, monitor how fast we're coming up as well. Um, and make a slow ascent, and you'll learn about this as you uh, as you uh, learn your open water and as you do your diving. To always make slow ascents, um, and the reason is because if you've got nitrogen in your system, the bubbles as you ascend will start to expand. Um, the pressure releases, and that, that nitrogen will want to come out of your tissues, um, usually as bubbles of nitrogen. Um, they try to escape from your body, and if you come too fast, they'll uh, come out of solution too fast as well, a bit like when you open a Coke, Coke bottle after you've shaken it. Um, I'm sure you've all done that in the past. Um, open a Coke bottle that's been shaken up, the air comes out too fast, um, or oh, sorry, the carbon dioxide comes out too fast, and that essentially is what happens with nitrogen in our systems too. Um, and that is when we get decompression sickness, um, otherwise known, uh, used to be known as the BENS. Um, we call it decompression sickness now because that's a better name for it. Um, but there is a video that, that, pr that maybe explains it even better than I do if, if we can hit play on that one. Sometimes, when a fish is reeled up to the surface, it will appear inflated, with its eyes bulging out of their sockets and its stomach projecting out of its mouth, as if it's been blown up like a balloon. This type of bodily damage, caused by rapid changes in pressure, is called barotrauma. Under the sea, pressure increases by 14.7 pounds per square inch for every 33-foot increase in depth. So take the yellow eye rockfish which can live as deep as 1,800 feet. Here. A diver can regulate pressure in her lungs by... Whoops. Oh, that's okay. I know we can find it. We've got a patient crowd. Let me go. Hold on one second. Here we go. I knew everything was going too smoothly. Back to the slide. And you said what? One minute, 19? Okay. No, we've got this. Swim bladder to worry about. A diver can regulate pressure in her lungs by breathing out as she ascends, but must be wary of other laws of physics that are at play under the sea. Henry's law states that the amount of a gas that dissolves in a liquid is proportional to its partial pressure.
the air a diver breathes is 78% nitrogen. At a higher pressure under the sea, the nitrogen from the air in a scuba tank diffuses into a diver's tissues in greater concentrations than it would on land. If the diver ascends too quickly, this built-up nitrogen can come out of solution and form microbubbles in her tissues, blood, and joints, causing decompression sickness, aka the bends. This is similar to the fizz of carbon dioxide coming out of your soda. Gas comes out of solution when the pressure is released, but for a diver, the bubbles cause severe pain and sometimes even death. Divers avoid falling victim to the bends by rising slowly and taking breaks along the way, called decompression stops, so the gas has time to diffuse back out of their tissues and to be released through their breath. Just as a diver needs decompression, for a fish to recover, it needs recompression, which can be accomplished by putting it back in the sea. All right. I like that book that she was reading on the safety stop, Life Without Pressure. Yeah, it's true. It's a good video that it's an interesting one if you want to see oh. the whole thing. But that doesn't mean fish. Okay. So we have seen quite a lot. Thank you all for your patience, uh, even our technical difficulties. We appreciate you working with us through those. Um, but yeah, thank you, Claire. That's really important that we understand that there are going to be a lot of uh, kind of safety things that we have to keep in mind when we're mm -hmm. scuba diving, uh, especially when we're not only moving, but we're down there for, for quite a lot of time. So we've learned quite a lot. Hopefully, uh, I know personally that uh, even as a dive instructor in researching this, I've learned quite a bit. Um, how do we apply everything we learned by scuba diving, of course. So we get out there, uh, learn to enjoy the water, whether it's a lake, a quarry. I know a lot of people have learned to dive in a lot of different places, but wherever you can find a body of water, uh, you can always get out there and apply uh, your scuba skills and even impress some people with the scientific knowledge that you've got behind those, those sweet skills. Um, you can also take it one step further if you like. So as we've seen, we can't scuba dive without science. Uh, science helps us breathe, get, see, hear, move, stay underwater. Uh, without science and inquisitive minds, we would still be snorkeling dreaming of, of what is beneath those waves. So when we do become scuba divers, uh, we can certainly give back and apply everything we learn by scuba diving for science. So here at Broadreach, both Claire and I work uh, to integrate marine biology and ocean conservation into uh, a lot of our diving programs. You'll even see uh, uh, there I am uh, just busy with a slate kind of looking at uh, looking at everything under this transect. Uh, so we, we practice what we preach. Um, and so here at Broadreach, this is especially true of our, our wide range of marine biology programs and definitely feel free to ask us how not only you can learn to scuba dive, uh, but also the science behind scuba diving and hopefully you can dive with science for science. So that's a, that's a good little tagline to, to wrap things up. But thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight. Hopefully you were able to take something away for this, um, whether you are a scuba diver or an aspiring scuba diver or a scuba diving instructor. So. Uh, we've got a little time for Q&A. Uh, if anybody has any questions, anything that we can recap or clarify, you want to see uh, videos of hippos again, we can facilitate that. So uh, feel free to hang out and chat with us. And thanks so much for spending some time on your Tuesday evening with us. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you, thank you. Recognize Hi. some names here. Thanks so much for coming out. <laughs> oh. Thank you all. Oh, that's very nice. And we're so excited to see some, if not all of you this summer. We're really stoked to get back out there into the water. I know, we can't It's been a long wait. time. This has also been recorded too, and so if there's anything that you guys need to go back and, and check or, uh, or you miss something or you know anyone who wants to watch it um, who wasn't able to be here, um, it'll also be uh, on our website at some point in the future for, for everyone to have a look at. Yeah, we're actually going to be applying everything we've learned. We've got two of our, uh, two of our staff members here at Broadridge HQ that are learning to dive. Uh, here in Raleigh. So uh, hopefully we'll get to the Caribbean soon, but we're going to be uh, all fully certified uh, here in the fall. Fingers crossed. 
Oh, Claire, we've got a question uh, regarding COVID-19 and diving. I know you've looked <sighs> into some of this from, from Patty and from Dan uh, as a respiratory issue. Anything that you've, you've seen or any top line? Uh, Not really. I think um, there's a lot that we still don't know. Obviously, I think they're um, doing a lot of research probably still. Um, however, um, it being a respiratory, a thing that affects our respiratory system, it definitely is something to be aware of if um, you've had any issues or if you have been diagnosed with COVID-19, you should definitely see your doctor um, before you go diving. I know Patty has now added a question about it on the medical form. Um, and so we should all be just aware that it does affect our, our lungs and they're important obviously when we dive and so uh, we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and, and getting signed off if we've had a COVID-19 diagnosis certainly but I think there's still a lot to learn there's a lot of uh, research going on and, and people a lot smarter than than us are, <laughs> are working on that I'm sure um, it's still early days I feel like uh, from there Hi. Christina's asking, where have you enjoyed scuba diving the most? I know I have um, enjoyed Thailand, I think, the most, um, although I do love the Caribbean. Thailand, for me, was, was, a, was a highlight. Lots of manta rays and, and curtains of silverfish. So. Mm. Oh, we've got a question. Where can I go in Raleigh to learn to dive? That's a really good question. Uh, so there's lots of good dive shops in the area feel free to reach out to us. We can make some recommendations. Uh, but when it comes to actually diving, uh, a lot of people will do their work initially in a pool, and then they may graduate to Fantasy Lake, which is where we're going to be taking our uh, instructors here at Broadreach uh, to go diving. And so that's, uh, that's a big quarry. So visibility can be a little bit hit or miss, but it's really fun because they have actually like, sunk in objects down beneath the beneath the uh, water. And so if you want to even go a little bit further away, uh, when you're doing your four open water dives, uh, you can go out to uh, Moorhead City, which is right on the coast, about two and a half hours from Raleigh. And there's some really great uh, diving out there. Uh, famous wreck diving, really cool. You'd think that that part of the Atlantic would be uh, poor visibility, not too cool, but it's actually, uh, it's actually quite beautiful. So yeah, you can learn to dive really anywhere, any state. So let's see. And so that, that kind of that answers Blaze's question here. Where can you go to learn to dive? Uh, really anywhere, uh, even in, well, you could go diving uh, in the North Pole or, or the Antarctic, but uh, learning to dive, you can learn uh, yeah, pretty much in any state that you live in or any country that you live in. So. Yeah. If you want specific recommendations on dive shops in any area that you're looking at, just let us know. We're happy to, uh, happy to reach out not only uh, to each other, but also to <laughs> our network of dive instructors, some uh, who are here, I see, which is great. Um, we've got a question about concerns regarding rental regulators and cylinder safety. So you're always, wherever you get your gear, wherever you rent it, you're always going to do your pre-dive safety checks. So that's something that we talk about in our open water class. So you're going to check your purge valve. You're going to check the cylinder itself, make sure that the cylinder has been visually inspected. And that's going to happen once a year. You're also going to make sure the cylinder has been hydrostatically tested. Uh, and that's going to be every five years. And you'll see all those markings on the tank. So you'll actually see a visual inspection sticker, that red one over there, that just means mm -hmm. that somebody's taken off this top, looked inside of it, made sure that there's no pitting or corrosion or rusting, make sure everything looks good. And then it's actually gonna be expanded, hydrostatically tested. Um, so they'll pump a bunch of water in here. It'll be filled to five thirds of its working pressure. So it'll actually expand and then contract. I just wanna make sure that the walls of the tank are, are looking good. So uh, you'll see those markings on the neck of the tank when it's been hydrostatically tested. And if you can't see it and you're renting a tank, always ask, hey, uh, I don't see a visual inspection sticker or a hydrostatic sticker. I wanna make sure that this tank is in good working order. Um, you're gonna connect your regulator to it. You're gonna smell the air. You're gonna taste the air, make sure everything is good there. So uh, that's something that you're gonna get used to doing before every dive and something that uh, as you're uh, going through your open water course, get really yeah. proficient at. 
And I think um, from what they've, as it, as it pertains to COVID, I think for tanks, um, because there's always pressure um, pushing out from the tank, I don't think there's concern about anything going into the tank when they fill it, um, which is, so that's not so much of a concern. I think the thing to be um, um, wary of is just how people sterilize their rental, their mouthpieces, and also ma perhaps masks and things like that. Um, but with good like sanitary techniques, they should be uh, they should be okay as long as they're um, as long as they're following the guidelines. And there are some guidelines, like I say, it's it's early days for diving in COVID, um, but Dan and Patty have released some um, guidelines for ways to adapt teaching and, and ways to adapt things um, with. Uh, to accommodate concerns about COVID and social distancing and sanitizing things a bit, uh, a bit more than perhaps we used to. So um, people are thinking about it um, and the, the advice may change, um, but it's just good to, to ask about that if you're renting equipment or if you're diving with a dive shop, um, they'll be sure to tell you what they're doing to, to help. A question about diving in the Gulf of Mexico. I have I have not done any diving in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there's some good diving out there for certain. There's lots of great wrecks. There's decommissioned oil rigs. Um, the Gulf tends to be a little bit shallower, so you have to go a little bit further to find uh, find some depth for your dives. But uh, there is a lot of cool stuff. Uh, and again, it really anywhere you go diving. But um, I have not been. I know some. Uh, some divers out in the Gulf of Florida, though, that they find some pretty cool stuff out there. So it's going to be pretty explorative, um, but it yeah. is pretty neat. And so, Blaze, I've got a question here. So is that uh, where you go to learn to dive for the high school dive trips? How does that work? So all of our courses, and you can uh, chime in if I'm answering the wrong question or going on too much of a tangent, but uh, on all of our, let's say, Caribbean uh, Caribbean trips, the first portion is going to be dedicated to learning to dive. So those first three, four, five days, kind of depending on how everybody's doing, uh, are going to be dedicated to the open water course. We go right from the book into the practical skills, all that confined water work, going through everything with uh, all those things we talked about with regards to safety uh, and also getting you comfortable with a lot of the things we are going to apply here, like why things look bigger underwater, uh, why we get colder underwater. So you'll start to learn how some of this, this science applies in those early days of uh, um, early days of any Broadridge program. And so, yeah. Those, those uh, I'd say first five days are going to be just scuba diving intensive, but it's a great place to learn, especially in the Caribbean. Uh, oh, it's better than a quarry in New Jersey. I'll say that much. <laughs> For sure, definitely. Um, Riley asks, what pro uh, what programs do we recommend for first time? Is that's a great question. Um, certainly almost all of the Caribbean ones are really good for people coming for the first time because there'll be lots of people who are in the same boat literally and that they will be learning to dive um, and there are a couple of other ones that are good for for people who don't want to do a liveaboard trip um, if you want to go uh, if you're a middle schooler Belize they're doing some diving on that trip and that's designed as a beginner's introduction um, and did they learn on Curacao marine biology they learned they to dive do. too combining marine bio and diving, um, living at a research center and things like that. So um, yeah, definitely if anyone needs to have a specific recommendation, um, taking into account dates and things like that, um, we're certainly always happy to, to, uh, to give you specific advice, but sh yeah, definitely Caribbean is, is a good place to start looking. Um, our Caribbean trips are designed for like beginners, people who've never done any sailing or diving or any of that stuff. Cool, cool. If y'all have any specific questions, I'm going to go here in the chat. I'm going to type in my email address. I'll put mine in too. And send this to everybody. There we go. So if y'all have any specific questions, anything you didn't want to ask to the group, or if you just want to talk about scuba diving, that's what we're here for. So please give us a ring. 
uh, our number here at Bradreach. I'll just put it in here, easy to find though. And we'll tell you all about where to go diving in your neck of the woods, in the Gulf of Mexico. We'll find out how to get y'all scuba certified. And if not, come join us this summer and learn to dive with us. Mm -hmm.